Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. The, this morning was a really stimulating um, time, and I'm going to follow that up with uh, some applications of this technology and uh, show how we're using uh, machine learning and, and starting to use deep learning techniques to measure people's facial expressions and emotions uh, from videos. Affectiva was, is a spin-out from the MIT Media Lab, where I did my PhD uh, with Professor Rosalind Picard. And uh, Rosalind Picard was the founder of um, the Effective Computing Group at the Media Lab and also uh, coined the phrase and uh, wrote the um, sort of first book on the topic. And back in the 1990s when she started uh, looking into affective computing, which is the relationship between emotions and computers, it was pretty difficult to measure this type of thing uh, in the real world. So people had to strap computers to their bodies in order to uh, have what's wearable computing. And uh, it, was, it was difficult to collect data out in, in the wild in, in real life. Uh, but now we're at a stage where much of this technology works uh, quite reliably in more uncontrolled settings. Uh, so Affectiva, we're looking mostly at webcam videos. So videos that are recorded when people are in natural settings, they're watching media content, and they opt in to allow their webcam uh, to capture their spontaneous emotional response. And one of the main reasons or motivations for doing this is because emotion measurement in the past has relied on surveys and asking people to say, either verbally or through turning a dial, how they feel about something. And that's good. It captures people's em emotions in, in a way, uh, but it's through a cognitive filter. So it's, uh, it's requiring people to uh, cognitively analyze how they feel and be able to express that. I'm going to argue that we can complement this with an analysis of people's behavior through their facial expressions. Um, and also, we can use physiology, uh, both of which we, we, should, we, we can capture from videos of their face. And this gives a measurement of the visceral response, the visceral emotional response to the content that they're viewing or the experience that they're in, which is very much complementary to how they report the experience afterwards. And what's nice, because we can do this in uncontrolled settings, we can um, have people opt in via their webcam, we can scale it really effectively. Uh, so we've measured responses from people all, all around the world, and we're able to uh, quantify their behavior using computer vision algorithms. And then we can model it. We can build models around people's preferences related to uh, their spontaneous reactions. Uh, but also we can learn some fundamental aspects of how people express themselves. And emotions vary a lot across gender, across age, across cultures. And that's really important prior information that can help us learn um, to build better models, but also understand some of, the, some of the fundamental psychology behind how people express themselves. And we can iterate. Uh, so as we heard this morning, data really matters. And we found that in our research. The volume of data we can get really helps improve the accuracy of these approaches. So analyzing people's faces uh, typically involves looking at the shape and the texture of their uh, face and trying to pull out what facial actions are present. So that could be a smile, could be an eyebrow raise or a brow furrow. And then building uh, computer vision classifiers to discriminate between uh, different actions. And we can do this for a whole taxonomy of facial behavior. So there's, a, there's a, a taxonomy called the Facial Action Coding System, which allows us to objectively code these different actions. Uh, however, doing that, coding manually, doing that coding manually requires uh, expert training. So if, if we ask uh, human coders to label facial expressions, uh, they have to go through uh, a, quite a, a lot of training. And then there's still disagreement between humans. So one of the advantages of training computers to do this is we can do it much more efficiently. And we can also get it uh, in such a way that it's repeatable. And up until now, having the volume of training data that's required for training algorithms to measure facial expressions 
has been a limiting factor, especially when we get into deep learning and using techniques like that. We really need a large volume of labeled data, and it's only been in recent years where we can crowdsource some of that data collection and get hundreds of thousands of training examples that we can start to leverage some of these new techniques. But again, the internet helps us. So there's a huge amount of content online. It elicits all sorts of different emotional responses. And by capturing people's spontaneous reactions to uh, things online, whether it's ads, TV shows, uh, or political content, we can capture a lot of really rich data. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, so over the past four years, we've collected data from all around the world, from millions of different people. And we've also uh, had much of that data coded so that we can use it for training computer vision algorithms. Uh, and because we've measured content across the world, uh, it reflects many different types of media. So it, it captures a whole range of different emotional responses. And as I mentioned, data, the volume of data we have matters. So this chart just uh, reflects how, as we increase uh, the number of training examples we can give these algorithms, the performance really does uh, get better consistently. And uh, much of the work we've done so far has been using uh, more traditional computer vision techniques like uh, hand-picked features um, and then SVMs on top of that. Uh, but as we get into uh, deep learning and using uh, techniques like that, using the uh, unlabeled data as well as the labeled data, the volume has even more benefit, as we saw this morning, across many problems, and it's, it's true in understanding facial expressions. So we've started to use this data um, in, a, in a more scalable way, and we're starting to use the unlabeled data as well to pull in examples. As I mentioned, the la human labeling of this, uh, these videos, asking a human to go through each frame and label what facial expressions are present, requires training and a huge amount of time. It's very laborious. Uh, so being able to leverage uh, techniques where we can uh, very efficiently filter that data and only have the, the useful training examples labeled uh, is, is very, uh, very beneficial. But also, uh, by using data that's not labeled at all, uh, at least to learn uh, interesting patterns within the data, which we can then um, build upon using, trained example, using, uh, using supervised training. Uh, so I have a quick demo here. It's nice because it allows me to put a cute picture of my uh, nephew on, on, in the presentation. Uh, but one of the main challenges uh, we've been um, tackling is, is making this stuff work on mobile devices as well as computers. Uh, I'm going to show you an example um, on the Mac here, uh, but I can show you an example on an iPad afterwards uh, if you're interested. So what the technology does is to uh, capture the face, and then we're tracking feature points on the face, and then we're looking at different actions. So these actions can be uh, things like um, whether I'm closing my eyes, whether I'm raising my eyebrows, furrowing my brow, looking disgusted. Uh, so from these different actions, we can infer higher-level emotional states, uh, which is very important um, because most people don't want to know if you're just raising your eyebrows. They want to know what that means uh, in terms of the emotional reaction. Uh, so hopefully this gives you an idea of how it works. Um, and as I say, we're, we're making this work on mobile devices, uh, both via the cloud and, and actually on the device, uh, is one of the main problems uh, we've been tackling, uh, making these algorithms efficient. I'll be happy to show you more demos uh, in, the, uh, in the break afterwards. But I think what's the most interesting thing that we've learned from this data is not just how to uh, train computers to detect people's expressions, but actually uh, some of the fundamental aspects of how people express themselves. Uh, so we've got a huge amount of data uh, from people around the world, and we've looked at some of the norms that we can create from uh, those videos. So understanding how people of different genders and from different countries express themselves differently. One thing that we found very consistently across this data is that uh, males actually express less than females. And uh, this is true in, in many countries, but the, the 
difference is also dependent on the country. Uh, so this difference is, is biggest uh, in, in, um, in the US, uh, and it's actually smallest in the UK. So there's least uh, gender discrimination in the countries we've analyzed in the UK uh, versus others. Uh, and this is really important because a smile that people express isn't necessarily um, equal across different populations. If I see a smile from a male, that might actually mean something different. It may not, ha may not be apples to apples comparison when compared to a smile from a female. And emotions are, are very uh, variable across people, and so this type of normative data is, is really, really important. Uh, another thing we found is that across countries, there's a lot of variation. Uh, but actually, one of the most interesting things is this variation is related to how um, individualistic the culture is. So people tend to express more in more individualistic cultures, like in Western Europe and the US, uh, versus more collectivist cultures, uh, such as in Asia and South America. And there's a, a number of psychology theories behind this, uh, but the fact that we're able to uh, find experimental data which backs up uh, some of these theories is really exciting. Uh, so we can actually show that there's correlation between how much people express um, when they're naturally responding to content and the type of culture that they, they're in. Uh, we've been applying this to um, looking, measuring people's preferences to content they've wa they're watching. Uh, we'll, we've also been applying it to behavioral measures, so understanding what products people actually buy and how the emotional content of the ad they see is related to the effectiveness of the ad. Uh, and we've also been looking at political content, which elicits a whole range of different emotions than traditional advertising. So political content can often elicit um, much more negative uh, types of emotions. And that's really useful because it gives us a, a much bigger range uh, of observations on which to base, um, base our analysis. Uh, just looking at ads alone gives you a lot of data about positive and neutral responses, um, but you want, also want to measure uh, people's experiences when they actually uh, feel disgusted or feel angry or feel fearful. Uh, so this, this technology, uh, I think, is useful in media measurement, whereas we've been applying it mostly so far, so measuring people's facial reactions to media content they're watching online, whether that's in a controlled way or in a out in the wild where people, just, where people are just surfing the web. But also there's many other applications, and this is where um, some of the things we heard this morning, again, are applicable. Multiple mo modalities are important. So the face is just one channel uh, which will be helpful in, in many other applications, such as tracking people's health. Uh, there's a lot of research to look at facial expressions um, related to uh, conditions, psychological conditions, uh, depression, um, PTSD, being able to provide quantifiable measures of people's emotional response can help physicians potentially track how those conditions are changing over time. Also, understanding learning performance. Uh, again, as we heard this morning, learning is, is moving outside of the traditional classroom setting. A lot of people are consuming content through massive online courses, but teachers have lost all of the effective feedback, or most of the effective feedback they get, they're getting from their students. And so by being able to quantify that would be a really useful tool uh, so that as people consume courses asynchronously, we can actually capture the emotional responses of them, what parts they find difficult, what parts they find fun and challenging, in order to help provide feedback to the content creators, so the people who are teaching, what, what types of... Uh, what types of teaching content actually work more, most effectively when you're teaching people online in a, in a completely asynchronous fashion when, when you don't have them in the same location? And robotics. We're starting to see um, robots actually in a real-life setting. Social robots are starting to be, um, become available where people can actually you know, start to have robots that act in somewhat of a human way in, in their own home. Um, there are a couple of Kickstarter projects which have uh, been popular um, around this topic, and, and I think robotics really needs the ability to understand the emotional uh, aspect of human-computer interactions, not just uh, what you're saying, but how you're saying it, um, not just uh, what you're doing, but how you're doing it, whether you're uh, upset, frustrated, as mentioned at the beginning, 
or um, you know, whether you're happy, whether you want to uh, engage further in conversations or whether you actually want to be left alone. Uh, so that gives, us, uh, that gives you hopefully an overview um, of how emotion measurement can be applied and what uh, we're doing at Affectiva. I'd uh, be happy to take um, any questions and also um, love to show you some demos uh, later on. Thanks. <laughs>